webinar. My name, my name is Alec Cooley, and I'll be your moderator for today's program uh, for this uh, Bush Systems Green Thinking webinar, um, part of our regular series that we have going on roughly once a month or every other month, depending on the, the situation. Um, as the title shows you, today's topics um, is making sense of plastics recycling. Uh, we've all been hearing a lot in recent years about what's going on with recycling and plastics. Uh, there are a lot of questions out there, and so we're going to be taking a deep dive into that topic today. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, let me quickly introduce our, our, our panelists who are going to be uh, speaking today. First, I'll start with Nina Butler, who is a principal and the CEO of Stina Inc., a mission-based research and information technology firm that supports uh, more sustainable choices in resource management. Nina believes in delivering unbiased guidance to help stakeholders navigate the role that plastics play in the movement towards circular supply chains, valuing carbon and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Stina's information management system, relationships, and understanding of the plastics recycling landscape have made it a trusted organization to lead multi-stakeholder initiatives to improve recyclability for different types of plastics, as well as produce the annual study of post-consumer plastics recycling data in the U.S. and Canada. <clears throat> Nina's experience uh, excuse me, Nina's expertise and independence are widely respected. She's been invited to testify before the U.S. Congressional Hearing on Challenges Facing Recycling. She has also been recognized by the World Wildlife Fund as one of the women leading the plastic revolution toward a waste-free world. Nina has presented or participated on panels for numerous events, including the World Circular Economy Forum. <clears throat> We're also joined by Tanya uh, Randall, also with Stina. Um, she is the public and private engagement manager. Uh, Tanya manages the film drop-off directory, which is the primary resource educating consumers on what and how to recycle bags, wraps, and film, and is the data analyst for the two recyclability projects. Um, we're going to be learning more about Stina and about the work that Nina and, and um, Tanya do um, in just a moment, um, but uh, we're excited to have both of them participating um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as always, we we, um, we invite folks participating as much as possible. Uh, it's always a little frustrating as a webinar that we don't have the ability to really interact, but um, to the extent that we can, encourage folks to put notes into the chat. Um, you know, think of the chat as where sort of comments, sharing your own experience, um, observations, uh, if you want to you know, keep the conversation going. I encourage um, your presenters also to make notes in there as they get the chance. Uh, but do keep in mind, if you have specific questions you actually would like to see them address, uh, please put those into the Q&A, the separate uh, area for that. That'll help us keep it more uh, organized and be able to break those, bring those up. Um, and, and we do encourage questions. Um, you, you oftentimes we we uh, will run out. We may run out of time before we can get to all of them. But uh, but please. Um, you know, put those in there and we'll do our best to get to all of those as we go through. Um, also, just want to point out today's program is being recorded. Um, you'll be able to find the recording as well as a slide deck and some of the resources that are being um, referenced will all be posted online to the, to the Bush Systems website. We'll also be sending out an email in the next day or so pointing to those once the uh, recording is, is available to uh, access. <clears throat> um, if we can go to the next slide. So um, I, I want to start out just saying a couple of words to sort of frame this topic and before I hand it over. Um, and, and I'll start by saying, you know, there's been a lot of attention in recent years about the problems with the recycling system in the U.S. and Canada. Contamination has been a slow building crisis for over a decade now. And more recently, China's national sword policy has had a ripple effect leading to major disruptions to commodity markets, cutbacks to local programs. Um, and we've all heard the news stories about recyclables being sent to the landfill um, you know, some of this sometimes is, is urban myth, but but we all know that there's also a, um, a real kernel of truth to what's going on. Um, these issues have affected all material types, but plastics have arguably become the poster child for everything that's quote unquote wrong with recycling, um, or at least perceived to be wrong with recycling. Media stories and reports from organizations like Greenpeace have exposed many of the dysfunctionalities of how we consume and dispose of plastics. Whatever the nuance is to their, these reports, the leave behind message that many in the public are hearing is that plastics recycling is broken, if not an outright fraud. The question is, is that actually the case? 
Uh, many of us in the sustainability field have our own questions, um, but the complexities of these technical and policy issues that are involved around plastics make it difficult to really be able to tease out and understand what's going on. And so that's the purpose of today's program is to give sort of an unbiased, transparent, just exploration of what is happening in the industry? What, um, what, what's some of the, the, the realities behind some of these issues? Where is it going? How are things being handled? Um, and help us get a better sense of what is the place for re re plastics recycling um, in its relevance to our movement towards sustainability and a circular economy. So with that, we have just a, a quick live poll that we wanna do before we jump in. So if folks can take a second to respond to this question, um, we wanna try and get a pulse for um, folks understanding of, around uh, what's actually happening with recycling and recycling rates. So go ahead and, and uh, take a minute to make your comments here and then um, we'll look at the results in a second. Right, we'll, we'll take maybe another 20, 30 seconds. Um, looks like we've got a good turnout so far today. I see about 170 folks, all of you uh, participating. So that, that's great to see. <clears throat> and see some more responses coming in. So maybe we'll give this another 10 seconds. And let, let's go ahead and um, and publish the results so everybody can see them if we can. So it looks like, um, you know, I'm seeing here about 17% of, uh, uh, or roughly 17% of folks, um, you know, it can, can point to the, um, the aluminum as being a, having a low recycling rates, 8% um, of plastics making it in, uh, looks like a, you know, a large, large percentage, 43%. Um, that's the, the um, where their beliefs and understanding lies. Um, so this is this is good to see. Um, with that, let's we can go ahead and close that and let me hand it over to Nina and Tanya and take it from here. Thank you very much, Alec. I appreciate being invited to participate in um, this webinar series, um, Thinking Green. So Tanya, you want to go into the next slide? Um, Nina, do I guess you not what want I want to start to the poll. Huh? Do you not want to give the answer to the poll? I do. I'll get into it. Go ahead. Okay. So what I want to start by saying, maybe what I'll attempt more to do is to explain why we can't make sense of plastic recycling rather than trying to make sense of it. Because um, I really want us to think more about what the big picture systemic issues are that are really creating the fundamental barriers in recycling and also really try to think beyond just recycling right now. Um, so I'm just gonna state my very strong position that recycling is not what's gonna solve our solid waste and sustainability problems, but it's also something that we don't wanna throw away either. Um, so as Alex said, I'm Nina Butler with Stina Inc. Um, we are, are a, a research and technology company, and our passion is around providing better data for better decision making. Here are some of the tools that we've made available in the marketplace, and I really encourage folks to check them out and give us feedback on, are they useful? Are you using them? And our goal is to continue to make these tools as transparent and free to the public as we can. So. Um, this has been a, a real, some of them a real labor of love, but it's important for us to provide that transparency and looking at the issues around the value chain. On to the next slide. So for over a decade, um, before we were seen at Inc. and made the, the transition and uh, as the company for more recycling associates, we've been conducting this study uh, for more than a decade. So we've had this view of looking at the, the trends over time. And I confess that up until 2016, when the trend was basically ticking up, there wasn't quite the motivation to look, pull kind of up and look at the big picture of total production and looking at plastics relative to other commodities and looking at it from a more macro geopolitical perspective. But in 2016, 2017, a lot started to change. Not only um, did we have the shale gas revolution, the change of policy from China, um, 
there was a convergence of challenges that have happened. So here from the data dashboard that you can get to from circularityinaction.com is the, the high level results of the, the latest data on plastic collected for recycling. Um, the study is funded and, and made possible through the American, the Association of Plastic Recyclers, the US Plastic Pact, and ISRI. So high level, 5.1 billion pounds of plastic collected for recycling. It's a lot. Um, and the good news is that there's a 5.8% increase, whereas in the previous year, there was a decline. However, we have not gotten back up to the peak that we had in 2016. So we have, um, we're, we're pretty stagnant overall. Um, so, and then to put this into context, in 2000, in March of 2023, just in March and just for polyethylene, we produced 5.4 billion pounds of plastic. So the 5.1 is all plastics for an entire year. Um, March was one of the record years of virgin resin production. So just to keep that in context. So going back to what the poll question was, so 8%, this is the stat that's often quoted, only 8% of what you put in the bin gets recycled. Um, the fact is that's more of 8% of total production of plastic. So we're often not comparing apples to apples across commodity types um, in terms of the methodology for coming up with rates. So it's really important that we get more clear and more standardized as how we track plastics, but not just plastics, but all materials. So what this is really saying is that we need an increase in recovery across all categories. And we also need to focus more on what is available for food grade. I'll get into that more a bit later. Um, so yes, the correct answer on the poll was that um, what's not correct was that only 8% of what you put in your bin gets recycled, far greater than that does. Okay, so here's a different way of looking at the same data. So the major commodities that we track, it's bottles, non-bottle rigids, and film. And almost all the categories had a, a slight uptick from the previous year. HDP bottles and polypropylene saw a decline. With HDP bottles, even though the recycling rate increased, the reason it increased was because there's actually a, a reduction in the amount of natural HDP bottles put into the marketplace, which is important to note because that's where a lot of that's the feedstock for a lot of uh, PCR that companies have made commitments to use in their packaging. So the, the amount of material available for food grade is really focused in on where there's natural HTP bottles and PET bottles. Okay, next slide. So of these major categories, it's also important to, to point out that while bottles at 56.8% is a lion's share of what we collect through our recycling programs, um, film has become a much more significant piece of the pie, as well as non-bottle ridges. But within those two categories, a very large portion of those pieces of the pie are post-commercial material, not, not post-industrial, but post-commercial material, or and may be collected outside of the traditional um, curbside collected program. Next. The other trend that's important to, to point out is that while um, our rate is overall stagnant, the amount of material that's been sent to the export market has dramatically decreased and the amount going to domestic markets has increased. So we're now um, domestic markets are recovering 92.3% and only roughly 8% are going to overseas market, which is a major shift um, that we've seen. And with that trend, there's been more of a focus on the collection of segregated material, um, a higher focus on quality of material as we're looking to provide feedstock to the domestic market. So this is kind of the high level of like, there are some, there are some positives, some high notes within this data. I'm going to the next slide, Tanya. But as with all manufacturers who faced major challenges in the last few years, both with COVID as well as um, with just general economic challenges and disruptions in supply chain, it's particularly remarkable to look at what the recyclers, particularly in plastic recycling, have overcome to see that growth in the amount of pounds collected for recycling. This is chart goes, is from back from 2021, um, going back to the data that was just presented and the pounds collected. So the, the shorter bar chart is conveying the value of PCR for the kind of lower quality, what has not been um, color sorted, that is not food grade. 
When you get to the further processing required to get to um, color sorted and food grade, the amount in 2021, the value of that material surpassed the amount of virgin resin. So something that is made and put into the market after it's been extracted from the ground, cracked, refined, moved into a virgin resin pellet was actually less costly than the amount of material from recovered stuff that is recovered and not becoming damaged to the environment. So we have some pretty upside e economics, and that's the piece that I really want to tease out, that making sense of plastic recycling has to do with understanding the, un the economic fundamentals that are driving um, business behavior and consumer behavior ultimately. Do we have the right incentives and the right drivers in place? And so the two major areas to look at that are driving these kind of upside down numbers is how much do we subsidize the extraction of virgin material, not just plastic, but all materials. And then how much are we externalizing or not including in the true cost of material use on human health, the environment and communities. So I just want to state this and, and frame it in the fact that it is remarkable that the domestic reclaimers actually increased the amount that they're capturing despite significant market barriers. And next slide. So here's an overview of where the trends in terms of scrap commodities with the backdrop of a pri the price of oil per barrel. So the gray is the price of oil. And so you can see that there's a loose tracking of where the commodity prices are relative to um, where the, the price of oil is. And ultimately everything trends based on is the economy churning? Are we producing more? Is the GDP higher? Are we consuming more? And when, there, when there's more consumption, there's more demand for recycled commodities. And when the economy slumps or we're not extracting more, producing more, producing more waste, the value of commodities tends to drop. And to me, that's a very perverse relationship that even when our economy slows, we sh that should not translate into not maximizing recovery of the material. This is kind of the point that I really want to drive home is that if we were looking at our resource management based on are we extracting the most value from sustainable materials management and preventing impairment to human health and the environment, would there be more value placed on recovered commodities or are we always going to be at the whim of where the consumption based economy is driving commodities with it being very much tied to the price of oil. So overall, you can see the trends, sorry, go back one more time, Tanya, um, with the highlights of where um, we had higher oil, um, oil and gas prices. We had the shale gas revolution at the same time that China was pulling back and saying, we do not want um, scrap commodities coming into our country. Um, and then with COVID really putting a real downturn in, in demand for all commodities, then pulling back up, um, we had a, a real increase. The turquoise line is the natural HDP bottles. It's a supply and demand. There are short supply, very high demand. So the price really peaked. And now we're heading into these really, really low numbers. We saw a drop of 50 cents per pound in natural HDP bottles in one month. So there is a tremendous amount of virgin resin um, capacity coming on online, um, which is keeping the virgin resin prices extremely low. And this is a, a global phenomenon, not just in the United States. Okay, next slide. So this is a study that just came out. Um, I got to join the stage with one of the authors, Margaret Spring, with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And this is one of the more um, comprehensive studies looking at what is the true cost of um, both production and use and disposal of plastics on human health. So you can see $592 billion in production and $920 billion in damages. And this is for just the United States. This is not global. Um, and this also does not include the impairment costs to ecosystems that are what we rely on to truly sequester carbon, purify water, provide food. Um, so I just want to put this um, out there, not to get into all the details, but I think this is one of the the fundamental pieces of data that we need to be looking at in terms of how do we truly evaluate the cost, the impairment cost of plastics and usage so that there's more value placed on its recovery. Next slide. So 
this is to kind of pull back to the big picture here. Um, the bar charts with the turquoise graph is the total production of just the top 10 virgin resin producers for polyolefins. And this is a couple of years old. So this number is actually um, grown pretty significantly. The amount of capacity for reclamation is the orange graph. And that's also growing, but not at the same pace as the growth in virgin resin capacity. So for just olefins, we have less than 5% of the capacity. So even if we're wildly successful in collecting material, we simply don't have the capacity or the um, return on investment to grow the capacity for reclamation at the rate we do for virgin resin material right now. So as we think about making sense of plastic recycling, we make sense of how do we close this growing delta between the amount generated and the amount recycled that we have a trickle of recycling compared to a tsunami of virgin plastic. We should know that this, the projection of this growth in the delta is expected to grow for decades. This is what global analysts in the petrochemical space are projecting. Most of the demand coming from China at this point shifting from the United States being the largest producer and consumer of plastic on a um, per capita basis. But this growth, part of the, the real driver for the growth, in addition to the rest of the world um, adopting the consumption-based um, practices, is that there, as there's a drawdown in demand for oil and gas, right now, plastics make up um, less than about 4% of what the fossil fuels that are extracted from the ground. But as there's less demand for gas as we move towards more electric vehicles and decarbonizing, there's a need to displace that the loss in demand for that. And so the expected growth um, in both base chemicals, and plastics make up about 50% of base chemicals, is expected to grow pretty dramatically over the next decade. In fact, right now there are um, some of the, the conferences that are coming up right now, the, the headlines are things like olefins and polymers transforming excess into opportunities, energy to chemicals adapting the energy transition from chemical demand growth. So that the real investment is shifting from the demand being um, fueling our vehicles and powering things to making base chemicals and plastics. And their legislation has just um, been proposed that would further um, reduce capacity and funding for the EPA and putting more of that into research and development around chemical recycling in order to be able to find solutions for this. So this is something I think as recycling coordinators, as people involved in policy, it's really important to be aware of this the bigger picture and how do we shed light on where we ultimately want to be going with materials management. Okay, so I want to switch gears a little bit. Next slide, Tanya. So this was a, a photograph taken up in Katmai, Alaska, where no humans currently live. It's the, where the fat bear competition happens, and it's under. This is the image under Hollow Glacier, and I, I joined an expedition. I have a couple of times now where it felt incredibly futile. But basically, this operation. There's an organization that's bringing students and and mentors out to collect as much plastic as possible over the summer when weather permits. And the reason is that there is a tremendous amount of international plastic flowing in to, from international currents and dumping on these the high energy rack lines. And the goal is to get it out before it further breaks down or gets pulled back into the ocean. When we were out in this meadow, and this doesn't capture the, the total beauty of it, just the wildflowers, just seeing that these um, giants up here, these grizzlies, but also the um, the other animals that are basically fulfilling the nitrogen cycle where the salmon go out deep into the ocean, come back, these animals eat them, poop, poop that out, and then fertilize the Tongass, the great boreal forest. It is a massive carbon sink for North America. And the amount of plastic was absolutely staggering. We pulled in 20,000 pounds of plastic in one week by hand. But the point here with the bear is that one of the scientists on the expedition with me, we had a moment of looking at the bear poop and gathering it to look at how much microplastic and what risk from an impairment factor of us leaving what is essentially an oil spill to break down into the environment. Are we ultimately fundamentally disrupting nature's ability to absorb CO2 because we're disrupting these cycles? Okay, next slide. 
here's kind of an overview of just how far and wide the material coming in is. Next slide. And again, so if we had an impairment factor right now, these organizations and, and the Ocean Plastic Recovery Project is one example of organizations doing this work. Um, they're doing it by asking grants from organizations like NOAA and others, as opposed to it being a marketplace where they're rewarded for gathering material and doing something with it, as opposed to it becoming impairment to nature. I think one of the things that's going to fundamentally change how we're managing materials is to quantify what the impairment factor is and to do a net environmental benefit analysis. You know, how, what is the most efficient way to be managing this? And to not look, to overlook the fact that we also just, are we turning off the tap? Are we looking at how do we fundamentally um, reduce the amount that's being produced? I just wanna to go to the extremes of what, how much the volume of um, waste and leakage into in the environment and how much more is expected because we're seeing this continued growth in virgin resin production. Okay, next slide. And to just, I wanted to take a moment to really celebrate some of the heroes in this space. I think we, again, focus too much on the recyclability or on our recycling rates or diversion rates when it really should be looking at, are we actually protecting what sustains life? Um, organizations like Five Dryers, um, with the initiatives in terms of driving policy, um, doing the science behind impairment and looking at um, microplastic incredibly important. And this image just kind of shows of all the things we talk about from recycling, very few on this particular set of materials are even slated to go into our curbside bin. So I think we sometimes do ourselves disservice by focusing almost too much on plastic, on recycling and the curbside system. Okay, next slide. Another organization that's near and dear to my heart, the Plastic Ocean Project. Um, as I mentioned, the EPA losing funding, not having the capacity to do the things like manage independent labs that are looking at what is the impairment of toxins, what are the migratory chemicals that are impacting endocrine uh, systems, what are we doing in terms of microplastic, how is it changing the critical nature of water? These are questions that we don't have the capacity to really wrap our arms around, and when we don't capture these impairment factors, then we're not functioning with a true efficient economic system. We're not allowing the free market to really drive the outcomes that we want. Next slide. And so in addition to doing lab work, these organizations, what I love so much is it's the cross-disciplinary nature of, are we educating? Are we touching people's hearts and minds? So the Plastic Ocean Project, in addition to having an independent lab, um, and doing collection uh, expeditions and outreach to their community and students. It's through art that I think, and music, that there's this real shift in how we, our relationship to the materials and natural world. Next slide. So kind of pulling back from this, the bigger picture view, I wanted to state all of this because we're looking at ways to preserve resources as program managers, how do we recover the resources that are already used? Um, to get to those, we need to design products for efficiency and regeneration. We need to inspire conscious consumption in a consumption-based economy. We need to drive participation and optimize the recovery infrastructure. But why is it that we're not getting there? Why is this transition to a circular economy not really happening? Um, if our recycling rate is stagnant, not just for plastics, for, for all materials, and we're producing more and more, what is it? What are the fundamentals that are not really moving into the circular economy? And, and this is the point that I want to make as clear as possible. The full cost accounting of our overall impact and our ability to do appropriate offsets to really reward how we do regenerative um, nature-based solutions how do we really facilitate this offset to give back to nature? When we have that in place and we have transparency, I think that is when we will start to see the true transition, the catalyst to circularity. Because I, I like to look at what overall is the highest, most important objective to keep focus on our North Star. If we want this objective, then what are the instruments that we need to achieve that objective? Next slide. So the great blue whale, I think, most people know that we've got a, a real risk to our, go back one slide, Tim. Risk um, to whales at large. And one of my 
friends, uh, Ralph Shammy is a world renowned economist has warned and reminded us that if we let the whales go, we're soon to follow because they fertilize the ocean. They're responsible for fertilizing the phytoplankton that produces every other breath that we take. And we're polluting the waters, we're polluting the whales. What Ralph says is if you have an economic objective, you have to make sure you have an instrument for that objective. If we know that we should be protecting the whales, why are we not valuing the services of whales? Next slide. So Tanya, this is, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but I encourage people to, to check out the data behind this and the storyline of really putting the value of services on nature as part of really driving a new economic paradigm. Next slide. And so going back to grounding us in plastics and how do we make sense or what is the next best thing that we can do as we hold space for looking at this bigger picture and bigger paradigm. If we know that recycling plastic dramatically reduces greenhouse gas emissions, it also um, saves energy, it prevents impairment to nature, why are we failing so miserably at this? So I think until we get clear on making sure that we have the economic instruments to drive the objective we want, we're gonna to continue to be in these um, failing recycling rate numbers. Um, so you can find more information on the Association of Plastics Recyclers that's done a life cycle analysis looking at energy savings um, from plastics. Next. So I've kind of given the, the what the biggest challenge I think is that's facing us and why we're stuck in a very linear economy. And just to fully drive the point home and then transition over to Tanya, if we have very low disposal costs because we've externalized all the costs on human health, communities, ecosystems, and we're subsidizing extraction of materials so that it's not even a level playing field with reclaimers, we can expect that we're gonna have a linear economy. We have to start looking at incorporating the true cost of production and disposal. That doesn't mean that we give up and throw the baby out of the bathwater, that we don't continue to do certain things now. We already have more human-made material on the planet than all living biomass. We can't not recycle. It's how we find the nuance of conscious consumption along with recycle right, byproducts of recycled content, designed for recycling, using recycled content, and producing better quality feedstock. This notion that we can just um, put everything together and chemical recycling will magically do something with it is wishful thinking. Um, on the other hand, we have, go ahead to the next slide, Tanya. Well, sorry. If we already have more material than all living biomass and a lot of it is not suitable for mechanical recycling, then we do have to consider some hard choices around decommissioning materials but I also want to really hold tight to, as we see in biomimicry and how we look at um, ecosystems and how they recover things, it's through diversity. It's through focusing on quality feedstock inputs in and put out. So I'm gonna to transition to more um, of a grounded conversation with Tanya to look at what are the elements of recyclability? How do we prevent greenwashing? How do we focus more on recycling rights so that we are actually getting the materials recovered? Tanya? Thanks, Nina. Um, so yeah, like Nina said, I'm gonna focus this in a little bit on you know the, the aspects of recyclability and how it pertains to consumer material and commercial grade that's going through local recycling programs through the MRF and then getting into the marketplace. And I'm gonna use two examples of projects that we've been working on at Stina for the last several years. One related to bags and film, you know, that are taken up through retail or, or drop-off collection and then consolidated that way back to recyclers. And then also understanding what it takes, um, what questions need to be answered and what data needs to be collected to take a, a format that's not traditionally been recycled or considered recyclable like a plastic squeeze tube. How do we move from the questions about it to actually making it something that would be recyclable and accepted? And so we built this, um, diagram that we call the decision tree in the middle, then it's a dichotomous tree with lots of questions and, and you know, it helps you figure out if you move from the left to the right, 
what you need to be able to answer in the affirmative to be considered recyclable. And it's made up of three key elements, which we call the elements of recyclability. One being the consolidation for market. Can you sort it, collect it, consolidate it, and get it to a marketplace? Is it marketable? Uh, is it market compatible and accepted by reclaimers? You know, the design for recycling matters here. And then the last piece pertains a lot to local programs and MRFs. Is it actually accepted for recycling? So, you know, the, the basic idea is is the majority of the packaging format compatible with and accepted by recycling markets that can process them into recycled feedstock? And I just want to point out too that this was created around plastics because of the work that we do at SENA. But the questions and the answers and the details to get to full recyclability are true across all sorts of commodities, paper, glass, metal, um, so that understanding that a package or a product being designed for recycling is going to be really critical when it comes to compatibility and acceptance. It also matters in consolidation if you're working with optical sorters and size and shape, 2D for paper, 3D for other uh, packages and containers. So the majority of the packaging format can be captured and there's sufficient ca uh, capacity to consolidate it for markets. That's where the MRFs and, and, and the equipment piece comes in. And then at the third leg of the stool is that there are recycling programs that are accepting and collecting the packaging format or the product for recycling. And that's where obviously local programs or the retailer when it comes to film and bags really matter. So that you can see same sort of thing, recycling right, using recycled content, designing for recycling, work around this orbit, as well as understanding the elements of recyclability. And going back to the to the poll at the beginning, it also matters how we measure what we're recycling. And so if you start at all plastics and containers, uh, all plastic containers and packaging, excuse me, we're at about 14%. But when you get into the items that we all really think about, PET, HDPE, and polypropylene bottles, that recycling rate doubles to 27%. When you add in jars, you're closer to 30%. But then understanding that not every other commodity has exceptional recycling rates, if you look at broad, um, broad categories like all aluminum, including pet food cans or pie pans, are at 35%. But when you're only looking at soft drink or beverage cans, we're at 50%. Understanding as well the role that cardboard has in raising the recycling rate of paper. If we look at containers, paper containers and packaging that you're going to find a lot in consumer and commercial um, streams, we're only at 21%. So I think understanding as well that across the board, the recycling system and infrastructure in the United States could really use a boost and we really could be doing a lot more to get back a lot of different materials, not just plastic, I think is really critical. Um, but I know that a lot of you in your registration form had questions about, like, can, is it possible to make plastics less complicated? You know, how do we make it less confusing? And the answer, the short answer is yes. But I think one of the challenges with plastics in particular is that it's a diverse material. And that complicates the recycling and the recycling messaging, I think, sometimes. So not only are there lots of different types of plastic resins, we've got seven numbers, six are indiv individual resins and then obviously the number seven other can be any number of plastics. It could be combinations of the first six or it could be something completely different. But then there are also manufacturing processes that influence how recyclable an item is. For example, just talking about like HDPE number two, you know, beverage or food bottles or laundry detergent bottles or shampoo bottles are blow molded. There's a form gets heated, it gets blown up and it makes the, the, the size and shape of the bottle. And those have different properties from an injection molded bucket. And they're not necessarily recycled together. So even though they have the same number on them, that stream is often segregated when it gets to a recycler. And it's the same thing for a PET water bottle and a thermoformed clamshell. They're both number twos, but they're not necessarily recycled in the same way at the same rates by the recycler at the end of the life. So I think it's really critical to understand from your MRF and from the markets that are buying from your MRF or from your broker, what does the market actually say and what bail specification are they using? Um, the Association of Plastic Recyclers has a whole suite of plastic specific bail um, specification and ISRI has for other commodities as well, but we really believe that markets should really help drive your program acceptance. If you're accepting something that's not marketable, it's probably not being recycled when it gets to the roof claimer because they don't have a way to process it or use it. So I think it's really critical 
there'll be a link to the um, bell specifications at the end in the resources. So if you need help finding that, feel free to reach out because I think it's really critical to understand the marketplace for plastics and for all commodities and how program acceptance is related to that. And one of the things that we offer as well is um, a website called plasticmarkets.org that helps connect buyers and sellers of recovered plastic scrap so that if you have a material that you're trying to market or sell or trying to source if you're a reclaimer or a recycler, you know, how can you find that? And I think one of the critical pieces here is recycling happens very locally. You take it from a household or from a business it goes on the truck, it goes to a, a transfer station or a MRF, and that's very local. But then markets for materials can be not only here in the United States or Canada or North America, or they, there are also global markets for specific commodities as well. And so I think we have to understand that what we determine is recyclable and accepted in a local program can be driven by something that's happening very far away. And so I just wanted to touch a little bit on the plastic squeeze tube project like that I mentioned because we had to figure out what does it take to make a format that wasn't readily recyclable or, or listed as an acceptable item five years ago or 10 years ago, and how do you move to recyclability? And so, as you can see, we pulled a lot of slides together. We talked to converters that make tubes. We talked to brand companies that use tubes. We tested compatibility with the colored HDPE bottle stream. We've done sort tests to see how they move through, through MRFs. We understand the rate of converting from non-recyclable designs to recyclable designs so that we can have conversations with the industry to be able to say, hey, we know these things. We know that tubes of a certain size can sort. We know that tubes of a certain um, uh, market sector like toothpaste are making the, the changes to um, recyclable designs. Then how can we actually start having that conversation so that they can be deemed technically recyclable Reclaimers can add them to their bail specifications, so then we can sell MRFs in communities that you can actually accept this, and that's a work in progress. And we're really kind of getting to the final stages to be able to really speak to that. And the flip side of that is something like bags and film that are collected not through curbside, typically, that they really do rely on drop-offs at retailers. We have the drop-off directory on bagandfilmrecycling.org that really helps the consumer understand, A, what can be recycled, and B, when you put in your zip code or your address, what locations are available both in the map view and in list view to be able to find that. And then we also have a feedback loop that if you get to a store and you find that it, the bin's overflowing or the bin's not in place, you can get in touch with us. You can also contact us if there's a store that needs to be listed so that we can add it. And we really do get a lot of feedback from consumers across the United States. And that, that speaks to from the film perspective is we know from the fourth row down that PE retail bags and film grew 8% 2021 over 2020, so that we know that material is actually being sourced, being collected, consumers are dropping it off, stores are collecting their back of the house material as well, and really driving this growth in film recycling, because you can see film overall grew 12% in 2021 over 2020. So I think that's a really critical piece. This is a material that's typically not accepted through curbside, but really has a strong marketplace and we are seeing material, you know, 1.1 billion pounds in 2021 collected for recycling. And I think this is also a, a type of package that we're not going to see really going away. It's thin, it's lightweight, it's efficient, it's unbreakable, and it really does a great job of packaging a lot of things. So I think how we get more consumers involved is going to be really important. And then just to wrap up kind of the last few pieces is when you're looking at how you want to educate about plastics and particular fall materials, we find that saying and showing what you accept and what you don't accept is going to be really important. This is a really great um, flyer that the state of North Carolina created that could be used across the state and then individual programs could make adjustments as they needed to, but also making sure your list and your flyer are easy to find on your web page. I've done research for uh, availability of recycling studies, and if I am paid to look for information and I still can't find it, there's no way your consumers are finding it either pushing it out on social media, putting it out with tax bills, and just making sure that it's front and center really helps the consumer get it right. Focusing on the most volume to accept and also the most contra problematic contaminants to exclude to keep your list short and sweet so it's easy to digest, I think is a really important piece as well. I think understanding and reiterating that the resin ID code, so those numbers one through seven, are not recycling symbols. Just because it has a number 
does not mean that that plastic is necessarily recyclable. And I think a lot of consumers are confused by that, especially coming out of a period where in the past we had recycle all plastics one through seven. And we're really at the point now where programs really aren't able to recycle all of those different types of plastic. And there's really critical bottles, containers, jars, jugs, tubs are really the kind of plastics that really have um, long-term sustainable in markets. And then encourage consumers to empty their containers because no one really wants all of the peanut butter or the water or the soda left. And then also, you know, thinking about messaging about reusables, bottles or bags or signing up to limit junk mail. So there's less material that the consumer even has to recycle in the first place, I think is a really critical piece where reducing and reusing come first and then recycling is also, you know, the secondary piece of that. And then lastly, we have to understand that buying recycled means you can be recycled. And so we have the buy recycled products directory. We have here the bush bin made from 100% recycled HDPE. We also have things like can liners. So both not only for us as individual consumers, but also as businesses and organizations as consumers, we do have a role to play. If you want the material that's collected from your program to be recycled, please consider buying recycled. And then lastly, understanding that there's a lot of plastic in our household, like Nina said, that aren't necessarily even ever intended to be recycled, but may have recycled content, may have low footprints. And so understanding when you're buying something or using something, can it be made with recycled content? Is it recyclable? Is it the most efficient packaging for the, for the product that it's um, containing and that sort of thing? So I think it's, we have a, a paradigm shift coming for consumer behavior that helps us also drive less plastic into the waste stream to begin with. So I'm going to kick it back to Nina to wrap us up uh, so that we can get to questions soon. So go ahead, Nina. Thanks, Sonia. So as you saw the image before with all the different materials, it's really important to think about where just where all plastics are throughout our built environment, medicine, durable vehicles. It's so pervasive. And we really hyper focus on packaging, which is 40% of what gets produced, but we have really remained too hyper-focused on that. So we created this chart just for some perspective with the turquoise being total production. It's a bit complicated in terms of what you include as exported resin, imported resin, um, but roughly let's just round up for an easy 100 billion pounds of plastic produced year over year in the United States and 40% being packaging. And when you break down that amount of packaging, you look at well, what is feasible for recovery. Our system's really designed with the material recovery facilities to separate containers from fiber, from cardboard and paper. And the trend is towards moving away from rigid plastic into more flexibles, which our system is not well equipped to handle right now. I'm pointing this out because I think what's ultimately needed as we look at how do we increase recycling? Is it also how do we increase what's produced that's suitable for recovery? Are we using the best material for the right application? Just to tease this out a little bit more, if you look at what's suitable for pre grade, it's really narrowed down to only, there's a couple of exceptions, but it's PET bottles, clear PET bottles, and natural HDP bottles. That's so it's a very tiny piece in the lower part of that breakout of packaging that's what can go back into packaging the rest of above packaging is very difficult to recover and so that's year over year a compounding waste problem so one of my wishes is that we look at how do we manage what's being produced in the first place so that it's safer that we have a larger piece of the pie that even is suitable for food grade. I think that's part of the problem is we've let um, regulations get out away from us and we're not regulating toxins the way that Europe does. Um, so we have a very low capacity to re recycle and we have an even lower capacity to produce food grade PCR. And herein lies the very difficult question. So what do we do with the stuff that mechanical recyclers cannot recover? And so this is kind of a chicken and the egg scenario, but we have to start asking these harder questions. What are we producing in the first place and how do we decommission the legacy materials that are already out there that we know we're learning more and more, but people have known for decades 
that things like PFAS or forever chemicals, the perfluorinated chemicals that are in a large amount of textiles, automotive, makeup, packaging, th these are the things that we can't just easily put the burden back on the reclaimer that if you can legally put um, a toxin on a food crop or in makeup, but then the recyclers help holding the risk for the converter or the brand company for the next go around, we've, I think, displaced where the responsibility needs to lie. So I just wanted to keep this as kind of our big picture. This is what we're dealing with. The amount produced versus what can feasibly be recovered is really out of balance. Okay, next slide. But I don't want to land with, so therefore don't recycle and therefore do we eliminate all plastic? What we failed to do, I think fundamentally, is look at what our North Star policy needs to be as a country. What I hear is, as Tanya mentioned, our work with um, some brand companies specifically looking at the recyclability of squeeze tubes. Companies are looking to design to meet both the standards in Europe, the United States, and the world. And there are often extremely conflicting objectives. Historically, we've been focused on does the package, is, is it functional? Can you market it? Is it pretty? Is it cost effective? It first has to work. And over the last five years, we've been really focused on recyclability. But remembering that for, say, polyolefins, we only have 5% of the capacity of what gets produced. Even if it's totally recyclable, it's still theoretical if there's no capacity to absorb it. So what I would love to see is a collaboration to develop North Star policy that really defines what is the circularity quotient, what is the trade-offs that you have to make to get to the lowest environmental impact solution? Does it serve the actual function of the product? And I think film is one of those, it's the poster child for really figuring out what should be used and what application. So instead of just getting a claim of recyclability or recycled content, what are the trade-offs across full life cycle impact to reveal what our circularity quotient might be? And then how do you properly offset so we have this full cost accounting? Next slide. So to bring it back to also the basic, if we have more material in circulation than all living biomass, we're in this crossroads of do we just stop using it? Do we stop recovering it? Do we not recycle it? Or do we maximize the recovery and put value on those companies that are utilizing recycled content, that are collecting bales of material, turning it into a feedstock? Do we reward those companies because, not just because they're diverting it from a landfill, but because they're actually preventing impairment from it becoming leakage into the ocean, into our waterways? Um, there's not, there's for very good reason, um, I think, nervousness around chemical recycling. The alternative is what then? So the landfilling of material right now is not a sustainable practice. I live in a fairly low lying area and getting more coastal in North Carolina. I envision these, the landfills that will be breached as we have more hurricanes and tornadoes. So I want us to focus on what we can do right now as community organizers, as recycling program, as an individual person in your household, are we maximizing the purchase of recycled materials? Are we helping support the alignment of value chains so that we can capture the most we can? As we're looking at, really looking at a true paradigm shift, how do we build capacity for organizing so that we look at why does it not make sense and how do we start making it make sense? Because we're truly designing for what it takes to sustain life on earth and prevent impairment to the ecosystems that give us water, air, and food. So I encourage you guys to get in touch with us if you're interested in um, sharing the tools that we have, providing more information and getting involved in a closed loop campaign. I appreciate that Bush is one really great example of a company using recycled content. Um, one example of their suppliers is EFS Plastic that has facilities in the US and Canada. And then we have some resources to share, I think on the next couple of slides. Oh, this, um, as we look at making sense of plastic, and I think hopefully we've made the case that it's it shouldn't make sense with our current economic conditions. Um, two people that have really inspired me recently, 
actually three. Ralph Shammy is the economist that I mentioned, and he's in this podcast and many others and has TED Talks. Um, he's retired from the IMF, but he's with Tom Rand, who wrote The Case for Climate Capitalism. So looking at it from an inv investor's perspective and Ralph looking at it from an economist, how do we incorporate and shift an economic model that puts value on nature in consideration of nature and human health first? The other um, great visionary I think of our time is Ken Stanley Robertson, who's one of his more recent books is Ministry for the Future, incredibly inspiring and looking at, again, a shift in economic paradigm that puts value on, on nature. Next. And here's some of our resources, and I was not exhaustive. I'm already thinking of organizations I wish we had added, but upstream really pushing how do we systemically change into more reuse and local. Um, the same with looking at the true um, zero waste certification, their guiding principles, I think is very important. And then um, pushing for better design and recycled content, looking at the um, resources from APR as well as the bail specs. What do the markets actually want? Next slide. Um, this is a video, I don't, yeah, there's the URL um, from one of the Alaska expeditions. It's only about five minutes, but really, really beautiful and inspiring. And I, there was a question that maybe we can get into in the Q&A about um, the environmental impact of these expeditions. And then here just, um, I did a laundry list of more recent publications on the impacts from, from plastics that we start looking at. Um, how do we include impairment and externalized costs to really drive true recovery. And thank you guys. Um, what I love to end with is the potential for innovation through inspiration from nature is as great as the risk we face by ignoring nature signals. We want to help unlock that innovation. Great. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Tanya. That was a uh, fantastic lot, lots of information there. Um, Plastics is a complex topic. Um, there's there's a lot to cover, um, obviously, but but that was a, that gives us a good overview. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, let me start off with with covering some some basics, and these, these are some of the the questions that I've seen asked, just being asked or discussed a lot to Stephen on on a media level, trying to understand, break down some basic aspects of the of the recycling system. Uh, you mentioned at the at the start of your presentation uh, that your know, recovery roughly 5.1 billion pounds of uh, uh, plastic resins being being recycled. And, and so a couple of questions. One, we've heard, you know, the Greenpeace report cited um, that, that you know, the amount of plastic actually being recovered was only about 5%, 5 or 6%. But I've also heard that that sort of, sort of uh, the way that's playing with the numbers um, may not be entirely accurate. Can you, can you cite, I guess, what are sort of as a percentage of, of total plastics being generated, what percent are actually being recovered at this point? Well, I'm going to steer away from coming up with a rate because we don't have the denominator. That's something that as an organization and with other stakeholders, we um, and ideally with the National Institute for Standards and Technology, we need to really revisit how we standardize at the recycling rate for not just plastic, but all materials. It is, we are really comparing apples to oranges and it's not just in the United States, Canada, Europe as well. We do not have standardization right now. So I, I don't know that the 5% is off because the latest number from EPA was from 2018. It, we know that virgin production has gone up, more material has been imported. So that might be within the ballpark, but the point is that it was based on extrapolations, not based on the original research that Stina does. And it takes us a whole year to get that data. Um, and similarly though, as we look at say aluminum, like are we comparing just aluminum cans to all plastic recycling? We, we often see this, well, you know, it's really low compared to everything else. All materials are low. That, that's the bigger context I think that we need to stay focused on. Yeah, and I think when you talk about sort of the apples to oranges, I know one aspect that I've heard cited is that you know, there are single use plastics, which is typically what the recycling system is designed to handle. It's not designed for an old big wheel, an old, you know, the plastic case of an old television or, you know, some of the, the what's tended to be more durable. Um, if the recycling system isn't actually designed for it, is it, how, how fair is it to say that, to calculate that as part of what's being recovered or not? But yeah, to your point, it, it, it's complex. Yeah, and I think what, one of the questions was, is diversion what we should be focused on? 
yeah, if we're not looking to measure what we actually want to thrive as humans and communities, perhaps we're not moving in the right direction. I, I think that is exactly what it's the, we need to revisit our solid waste policy at large for a country. It's been broken down by it on a state level and it's kind of willy nilly, but what is our North Star? What do we want to encourage? And how do we build a community where it's not just a top down, but capacity building to really learn what works for each region and then look at it more systemically? Yeah. yeah um, I mean, and I would add, I think there's a, a real piece of like fit for use as well, right? Like. I think we, we've just come out of a pandemic and we saw a lot of novel plastic items coming through, thinking along the lines of, you know, home COVID tests that we never knew were going to be in the marketplace five years ago or even three years ago. And so I think there's also this idea of as we need things, what's the best product to fit that need? And if it's not plastic, then is it aluminum? Is it glass? Or is it reusable? And we don't dispose of it at all. And we really get a lot out of it. And so I think that's also a really critical piece as consumers when we make purchasing decisions, what are we buying and what are we going to do with it? And if we really need it, you know, what's the best long-term impact um, or, you know, how do we limit the longer long-term impact of our purchases? I think that this is also, we become hyper-focused on recycling as opposed to looking at broader material and resource management. Similarly, we get too hyper-focused on the consumer does have a role to play, but how and how we use our collective purchasing power is important, but not to distract from there is a larger system and a, a need for North Star policy because the consumer can only do so much based on what's what's available. So I just want to be cautious of putting the blame back on overly on the individual as opposed to how we look at a very large um, system-wide paradigm shift. Yeah. It's, so an, another question um, that, that's been raised is, is just understanding the effectiveness of the system itself. For the plastics that actually get collected, get sent to a MRF, we know that there's always a certain percentage that um, that's contaminated, gets thrown out. And, and that's been one of the critiques is that, that Oftentimes we measure what we are delivering to a MRF, not what's actually coming out of the back end. So, so what one question is just you know, for that 5.1 billion, is that actual material, clean material on the back end that's being put into reuse, or is that counting what's being delivered? That's just uh, what's collected for recycling. That is not what actually gets used in a product. So um, and this is a, a really big point, but and I tried to touch on it a little bit, but as and we've been warning. I produced a movie in 2004 called Point of Return. Like you cannot depend on ship, putting everything on container ships and shipping it over to China where there's virtually no feedback loop in terms of quality back to the producer or who's generating material. So we have seen some streams actually clean up, but we continue to see diversification in the types of packaging. And so there's not really an overarching, what are we designing for? That's why I keep bringing back the North Star and circularity quotient. So we, if we had more clarity on what we're producing and why, then how do we optimize the recovery system for what will exist? What we, what needs to be eliminated and what will remain and what will be the emerging materials? We don't have kind of a sight on future thinking. We're just always kind of responding to what's being put in the market. And I think we need to reverse that, that basic design. Um, so going back to what's the efficiency in recycling, when you're looking at the major commodities, and what are the typical inbound streams? There, the amount of bottle material, the amount of contamination of film going to retail is actually relatively low when you get into more complex streams and you're mixing um, commodities in a mixed rigid, you're gonna have more contamination. You're gonna have more yield loss. And so then it's about commodity or um, getting the scale and volume of material in order to justify its own sort, its own reclamation line. It is. Um, recycling is all about quantities. You have to have enough of it to make sense. And so it makes it difficult for emerging streams. And that's why it's difficult. We're not, I'm not sure that we're thinking about our labeling schemes in a way that's future thinking or driving the action that we, the intended outcome. Well, and 
I want to add one quick thing to Nina. I, I think to Alex's original question, we're talking about when we're talking about the 5.1 billion pounds, it is outbound from the MRF inbound to a reclaimer. So it's not all plastics collected from consumers going into the MRF. It is once it has been bailed and sold, we are collecting it as it gets to the reclaimer. So the amount of material actually collected from households in the truck and sorted is probably much higher. So we're talking about something that's been sorted bailed into commodities or collected commercially and then sent to the reclaimer. Got it. Um, it um, you, you mentioned, uh, Nina, a, a moment ago, um, you know, China. And obviously that was the big dominant news story five years ago is that China was no longer going to accept our plastics. Um, and so, it, and that's largely been the case is that it's now going to other places. Where is that? Um, it, can you just, you know, high level talk to sort of the trend where, where where is all the material going nowadays is it staying in the united states is it going to other asian countries or can you give a high level sense of kind of all of the above so there were a lot of communities that stopped collecting the wider range and just simply stopped bailing mixed rigid materials because we were so high overly um, dependent on the export market for that um, and then there was a shift to other Asian markets and some European countries that were taking material as well as um, to Mexico and, and Central America. But there's also, so there's both less material being collected because there wasn't really the, the economic case to collect it and sort it. There was a shift to other countries and like I showed the increase in material that was being processed by domestic reclaimers. Uh, okay. Um, and then I guess a, a last question just on, along this line is um, another critique that's been made about the recycling system is that, you know, when it's going to these, you know, the Asian, uh, Southeast Asian countries and et cetera, um, problems with material getting dumped, you know, it gets sent over there being called recycling. And, you know, it, is that is that still a primary concern? Is there a reason for you know the sustainability manager managing a program to have concerns that you know the material that they make an effort to responsibly collect and keep clean um, uh, it, is the system such that they can be confident it, it is going to actually get into the correct recycling system? It's not being dumped um, or. or um, well, there's another question there. Is it sustainable to put material on a, a ship that's fueled by bunker fuel that's pretty problematic in itself, just moving material all the way across? I mean, we do this for other commodities besides recycling commodities, moving it far distance across the ocean. So I think there's a bigger question that we shouldn't be doing it. Are there, is there the level of oversight in terms of managing um, leakage, you know, from from the material. Anytime you move it, you're adding the potential for leakage. So I think there's no guarantee that it's being handled necessarily responsibly. And again, I wouldn't say that it's just a plastic problem. It's also a heavy heavy issue for other commodities as well, particularly fiber. So yeah, I mean, the more we can handle I mean, everything, think, we'll... go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, and I think also, you know, there's a there's an opportunity. We do bail sorts of all sorts of materials and the quality that comes out of something like a deposit system where you've got only bottles collected is vastly different than what you see, you know, coming out of a MRF and then even MRFs that have really good optical sorting that rely on, you know, um, NIR sorting to, to, to really separate plastics and then use humans um, for the quality assurance. You get much different quality as well. I mean, we've seen bales that have had you know, 10, 15% of aluminum coming in with the PET plastic. There's a lot of fiber. And so I think there's also um, efforts that we probably could invest more in our actual sorting infrastructure. We put everything in a bin, put it in a truck, and then we have to separate it again. And so I think that there's real room to improve the quality of the material that we bring out of a MRF across the board as well. So I think the whole infrastructure recycling in the United States and Canada could probably really use a significant, you know, boost of, of finances and support. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so if we want that to happen, then we need to look at, are we capturing the true cost of disposal? If, if it was more expensive to do the wrong thing, we would drive the behavior that we want. And so that's a bigger question of like, well, how do we, do we measure GDP, you know, for a consumption-based economy. Right now, everything is, you're fiduciarily more responsible if you dispose 
than recover in many cases. And if you use virgin material rather than recycled content. And so we have to get to the core, like crack that nut basically. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you touched on this in passing, and I, you made reference to um, you know, Association of Plastic Recyclers has done a life cycle analysis, and I've seen some other studies out there. But I guess from just a, a high level, um, in, in terms of looking at the greenhouse gas footprints of PCR versus virgin um, and others, is is you know it, it, I've heard it said that you know recycling, even if it works. You don't necessarily have that much of an environmental benefit, but um, is there evidence? Is is there research that shows that there is a clear dramatically eighty percent energy savings when you use recycled content over virgin? It is dramatic savings. The plastic. Yeah, okay. the the jury's still out in terms of chemical recycling, how much energy savings relative to virgin, but mechanical recycling, no hand. I mean, it's absolutely dramatic savings. Savings in water, savings in energy, savings in emissions. Yeah, um, and and I think these are all kind of questions I I know I've heard from a lot of sustainability managers who, who struggle with the basic question of, you know, if, if it's so problematic, should we be investing in that in the first place? Um, and so I think it, it's good to sort of at least get the sort of the different sides of the equation out there on the table to understand how we balance that, knowing we need to be moving towards a better system and improving it. Um, there's still a reason to keep faith with the system that as it is in place right now. I mean, as Tanya said, if there's a, a market for it and it's in the bail specs and it can flow through the MRF, like all, if, if there, then we definitely want to be capturing where there's demand for material. What I'm just trying to be really cautious of is but then the, like I get asked all the time, well, what, what, what would be the better thing? What should we be using? There must be some better thing we can develop out there. But there's a hard reality. And I say this a lot, but oil and then by extension plastics, are, it's like the opposite of our kryptonite. It gives us these superpowers. It allows us to extend life. It gives us the ability to breathe underwater, like all these magical things we get and then we're squandering it. So the point is not that there's we can displace it with something else necessarily. It really is the inconvenient reality. We need to reduce what we're using and to go to more local. It's a symptom of a very fast-paced society living highly dis disconnected from nature. And so as long as we're moving stuff all around the globe and we want what we want, when we want it, plastic is probably the best, lightest material to use to ship stuff thousands of miles and not have food waste given that food waste is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, I mean, it, they, I know David Alloway and Oregon is uh, some of the research that they've done is, is you know, pointed out that slightly inconvenient truth that even, even plastic packaging, flexible packaging that is not recyclable, the carbon footprint of sending products in that versus say a steel can that may be extremely recyclable, um, it's not even close. It's a much larger, G GHG footprint for that steel can, even though it's recyclable. Yeah, I was just with David um, last month or month before last for a Department of Energy workshop, and we were teasing that apart further. The problem with life cycle analysis, is it's, a, it's a starting place, but there's so much that's not included in the scope. What is the impact of extraction, the mining of whatever mineral, metal, that we're using, what's the impact on that community? What's the impact on the production, the use, and then the disposal? If we're really capturing the true impacts and impairment, we might have some different outcomes. Yeah. Good. Um, some other, uh, just to throw out some specific questions that have been coming in to the chat. Um, I've been, uh, I asked the question um, with, with PCR content in containers now, um, you know it depends by by company, by by um, by product. But um, let's say if we just look at containers for right now, is there sort of a, a state of where the use of PCR content is? Are are there sort of you know is there a, a relatively high percent, low percent? Um, if you sort of blur that line between the different options. Um, well, I think Ron Abbott asked about well, why is the natural HDB price plummeting so much? Because that's been the one that's been artificial, not artificially, high. it's been so high, it's been almost you know, just remarkable. Um, and so 
when we see a downturn or economic um, strains, the first thing that usually goes, goes, I've noticed within larger companies is a focus on their sustainability goals. It's like, well, we can't deal with it now. Right now in this quarter, we have challenges, so we're going to have to catch up later. I think most of the recycled content was going into packages because it was cheaper, or not packages, going into products because it was cheaper. And when the price of virgin goes low enough, you just cannot rationalize paying that much more for PCR when you can use virgin that's going to be more consistent. So I, it's just a supply and demand and what that can, what the market can bear, basically. So in terms of, you know, the upper limits of PET bottles can be really high for recycled content. HDPE can, the California Rich Plastic Packaging Law had a really big impact on stimulating demand in non-food grade applications. And I think we're starting to miss kind of getting our eye off the prize, particularly with some of the EPR that's pushing recycled content and harder applications. We're losing ground to smaller recyclers that can take uh, material and put it as become feedstock into applications that are not as sensitive and be more broad and larger in volume and use. So again, I think we have, we're not looking out for our unintended consequences as we drive recycled content, or we're pushing, calling the question on chemical recycling. Well, and I think Alec, you guys could answer that a little bit too, because you have bins that are using recycled content that I think are a hundred percent at the top and, and maybe, you know, even significant amounts and other things as well. I think that's a really critical piece you know, cracking the nut on how you were able to start to ramp it up, put it in, and then, you know, make a product that actually is functional and, and keeps the quality that you need to be able to be durable. Yeah. yeah. Well, with that, um, um, we were coming to the end of our time. Um, so I, I want to bring it back up my slide deck here and just run over a couple uh, things moving forward. Um, great. So um, I want to point out that we, we do have the, uh, the, the recording and the presentation slides, as well as a number of the resources that you saw listed um, on, on the slide deck um, are all, will all be posted to our website over the next couple of days. We'll be sending out a, um, an email to everybody who registered uh, just when those are available. So you'll know, be able to find those. Um, Um, I want to point out also that our next uh, webinar will be coming up um, in just under a month on September 6th, and um, this is when we're going to be, you know, moving up the up the um, the, the priority list, uh, looking at reuse and waste prevention. Uh, we did a program last fall that was focused on reuse around packaging, and this program, I'm excited. We're going to have some some great speakers from the Center for Biological Diversity, from Upstream, from Perpetual, looking at more. How do we? You know, what are some of the challenges? How do we actually implement these programs? How do we get past some of the barriers that, that keep us, you know, we, we've been talking about reuse and waste prevention for decades. We've always known that they were at the top of the hierarchy, but there's there are clear, obvious uh, barriers that have made it difficult to actually make that transition. So that's some of what we're going to be discussing with this program coming up on September 6th. So we encourage folks to um, participate with that and, and look for the links that will come in the emails um, after this program. Um, also want to point out that in addition to today's uh, recording, we also have the recording and, and decks from a number of our past webinars you'll be able to find on our website, um, uh, including food organics, public space recycling, strategic planning, um, other topics, all those you can find on our site, uh, pushsystems.com uh, backslash blog. Um, and in addition to the uh, reuse waste prevention topic next month. Uh, looking into the fall, we'll have programs coming up on centralized collection uh, systems from offices, as well as uh, taking another look at waste reduction from healthcare. So, um, more programs to look forward to in the future. Uh, but I also want to just make a, a quick uh, shout out for um, just for for something that Push this is doing. This is a, something we're about to uh, unveil. Um, in the coming months, but uh, something I think is exciting, and, and it goes towards how do we move towards a closer to a circular economy and and bring more transparency into um, 
how we're using materials and, and something that we're going to be doing with all of our products is is um, actually publishing the carbon footprint involved with the production of each one of our individual products. We've been working with this company, Carbon Graph, to go through and look at the transportation, the material, all the different inputs that go into um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, measuring the carbon footprint, and we've been doing calculations. So that's all information we're going to be putting up online in the, the coming month. Um, so look for more updates from that in the near future. But um, just excited about that and wanted to share it. Um, and again, I want to thank Nina Butler as well as Tanya Randall for this presentation today. This is great. There's a lot of information here um, and a lot to, to pull out. Um, you know, the, the resources that you've made available, I think, will also be helpful for folks who want to take a deeper dive. But uh, but very much appreciate the time you took to put this together and present. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're we're at the end of the program now. Um, I will point out that we're going to be sending out um, when when the program officially ends. Uh, typically, there's a prop up that shows up on your screen, um, and if not, um, there's an email that comes out tomorrow from the Zoom system. Uh, but we very much would appreciate any feedback that you can provide um, for for the speakers. Um, if you're interested in learning more information about Stina and what they're doing, um, there'll, there'll be an opt-in question that you can click on that survey. Um, to, to have your contact information shared with them. Otherwise, our, our default is that we, we don't share that information, but you'll have the chance to choose that. Um, and so we're, we're at the official end of the program. And as, as we do with other programs, um, I'm gonna drop off and our, our speakers are gonna drop off, but we do invite you to stick around if you're interested to learn more about Bush Systems and the products that we produce. Um, my colleague, Boris Bortzman, is gonna be joining us if you wanna pull up your, uh, your camera, Boris. Can make the introduction and um, um, I'm going to go ahead and make the handoff to you. Um, but otherwise, for everybody else, thank you for joining us today. Okay, it's all you, Boris. Hi, uh, thank you, Alec, and thank you, Nina and Tanya. That was really informative. I actually learned a lot as well sitting here listening to that. So, a lot of interesting things coming up in the future. And as Nina mentioned, Bush Systems, we're um, a North American manufacturer, we design and manufacture waste and recycling containers that use post consumer recycled content on all our bins, whether it's plastic or metal. Some of the ones here that I'm showing you are pretty much our best sellers. Um, they're triple stream design that are ergonomically friendly, where the liner comes right out, you can pull out the bag, and a lot of, uh, a lot of the maintenance guys really love them. And some of our signage that we really focus on specifically splits the streams, whether it's cans and bottles, mixed recycling, paper, waste, organics. And that's what we're really popular for. Uh, in addition to that, if you need any kind of customization with your signage, that's what we're here for. Whether it's the signage or even the bins itself. For example, this bin, we had a customer that wanted doors, we put in doors. You want a different kind of lid, we can do a different kind of lid. A modular system like this one comes in several sizes, several colors, and you just choose whichever one would be aesthetically the best in your uh, uh, in the current environment. Some of our other options are outdoor. Uh, we have several of them. This is just a small showroom that we, we actually use for presentations. But we have so many options for you. Uh, if you'd like pastors, if you want something modular that moves around a lot, no problem if you're going from room to room. Uh, here's another one of our best products used primarily with post-recycled content. Uh, it's one of our most popular brands for the last two decades, which is the Waste Watchers. Uh, they come in different sizes, different heights, uh, come with a dolly as an accessory. We have the signage as well. Uh, we actually just released new signage. They're more, actually really more, nicer, sturdier, and like I said, different kinds of signs uh, <clears throat> work well with different environments, whether it's does it organics, waste, even battery, cell phone recycling. And we have a catalog that I'll be more than happy to shoot off to you if you uh, have any questions or concerns. If you have any uh, also projects that you're working on or coming up, uh, let me know or let one of our uh, business development managers know. Give us a call. We'll be more than happy to help you. And if you guys have any questions, let me know. I'll be happy to answer them right now. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.